The Boko Haram insurgency has displaced nearly 2.4 million people in the Lake Chad Basin. Although the Nigerian military has regained control in parts of the country's northeast, civilians in Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad and Niger continue to be affected by grave violations of human rights, widespread sexual and gender-based violence, forced recruitment and suicide bombings. In 2019, the Nigerian refugee crisis will be going into its sixth year. Since violent attacks of the Islamist group Boko Haram started to spill over Nigeria's northeastern frontier in 2014, Cameroon, Chad and Niger have been drawn into what has become a devastating regional conflict which have left thousands displaced. In an exclusive documentary, Plus TV Africa crew visited one of the internally displaced persons camp in Benin City to tell this first-hand experience and the live experiences of internally displaced persons. It's been eight years of violence, 2011 to 2019. Why some are still sleeping, some are going to have their bath. This is how we began our journey to Uhogwa, Benin City. This is International Christian Center, Uhogwa, a home originally meant for the less privileged of this community and beyond. But since the year 2012 has opened its arms to the internally displaced persons as a result of the insurgency of Boko Haram. Today it has over 3,000 internally displaced persons and we have come to know exactly what life and how life is for these people. In 2015, federal troops were sent to evacuate these IDPs to the north, but that was salvaged through the intervention of the then state governor, Adams Oshomole, and some state officials, as well as well-meaning Nigerians. Today, they are stable here, but not without challenges, of course. It's not something that one ever think will happen in this country. Uh, every time I talk about it, it really hurts me. Um, when that began to happen and I started to relate with persons who were from those areas and they were telling me their horrible stories, there were times I could not eat for two weeks. It was it's like, I, it was just on me to do something, do something, do something, do something. And I had nothing that I, I didn't see myself like I was capable of doing something because the the, 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 the people that had need were quite huge. There were, there were so many. And the risk in venturing into such was not like just helping orphans and other persons we had taken care of before. But uh, the pressure on me was really very, very, very high. Down deep in my heart, I felt God wanted me to do something. And not doing it made me restless. You know, I couldn't. Eat, I couldn't sleep. Sometimes I just jump up at night and I would just be like, I'm there, I'm seeing them. And I would cry and cry and weep and weep and pray to God to stop these things. God, stop it. God, stop it. Internally displaced people are vulnerable in different ways. Lami is 18 from Chibok. She hopes to be a doctor someday and in senior secondary one. She's just about to go to her morning lessons. Her sister is one of the kidnapped Chibok girls. Her whereabouts up until today, yet unknown. Lami recalls the ordeal. 
The time that Boko Haram come to Chibo is just in the midnight. When we are sleeping, we, end, we are sleeping in Palomi and my younger sisters. And my mom also is sleeping. My father now lie down on veranda. In the midnight by 12, we now start hearing the shoot of gun. My mom now wake my father for him to run out of the house. My dad now run away. He now went to climb a tree. When we wake up, we now, my mom now said that we should, leave the, we should leave the house, we should run through the bush. And before we said we want to come out, the Boko Haram, they have already surrounded the place. And somebody now told my father, that, my mom, that we should not go out, that we should stay inside. When we enter inside, we are staying, we now see fire. And my mom, I now tell my mom that we should come out of the house so that the fire will not burn us inside. In the morning, we woke up. They now say that if you know that you have a child or sister or cousin in that school, that we should go to... Joining me in the studio is Plus TV Africa's correspondent, Amaka Okoye. She was at the, this um, IDP camp and joins us now. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. How was it? Um, get into the IDP camp? Was it uh, something you expected? I suppose when we hear some of this uh, news, we don't get uh, a full understanding of the reality until we step into the reality, to the place. Uh, going in there was eye-opening, quite overwhelming, you know, for the lack of time, we're not able to play all of that documentary. But when we got there, we realized, that's when you realize that, yes, um, the insurgency is real and it has hit people at different levels. When people begin to tell you how they lost their, their their dear ones in very gruesome uh, manner. You will be shocked to see that we don't know as much that is happening. There's just very little that media is able to tell you. So I, I would say going there is eye-opening. It, it brought me to tears. It was revealing the suffering is real. People are suffering really, the internally displaced persons. They found a place, that camp originally is not meant for the IDPs, but you know, uh, through the help of Pastor Fallorin Shaw, he opened his doors to these IDPs when it all started. Yeah, so it's hard, it's still hard. They they have found a place, but you know, no nowhere can be compared to a people's home. True. Uh, you know, so the difficulty, some of them are still traumatized, you know, some of them are still getting used to the reality that they may never have to go back to their homes, you know, get into the reality that they may never see their loved ones. Some people are there, like Lamy, for instance, she's the only member of her family who's there, so she doesn't know where her father is, her mother, even her sister she spoke of, we don't know whether she's still alive or dead, she's one of the Chibo girls. So those kind of stories you 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 come to know that indeed um Boko Haram is real and yes the government is trying but the battle is still on. Uh, just a quick um, uh, heads up that you can watch the full documentary um, on Plus TV Africa's uh, YouTube channel and there will be subsequent airing of um, the documentary um, on our channel just to get a feel. I saw a picture of somebody, uh, we call it here in local parlance, to soak Gary, mm -hmm. and then there was even no spoon. What was the uh, feeding situation like? So that Gary you see there is luxury, right? Uh, when we spoke to the camp coordinator, uh, Pastor Florence Shaw himself and uh, Pastor Elizabeth, who takes care of the kitchen and other logistics, she mentioned that they are able to feed just twice a day. So they have breakfast and then they have supper. They can't afford to feed them three times a day. Now to feed those people, they have, 50, they have to uh, spend, use 15 bags of rice for lunch. 15 bags, right? And that does not mean that they're going to get like fish and every other thing, you know, meat in it. It's just for them to survive. So feeding there is still a huge problem as of today. You know, is, is there any connection between this camp and the government? Are they providing for the people? Uh, well, there have been some intervention. It may not have been consistent, but they are not relying completely on the government. At some point, yes, they got help from the then state gov uh, governor, Adam Soshomale, when he was the uh, governor of that state, and some well-meaning Nigerians, but they are not depending on the support of the, of the government, so to speak. So they are just depending on the mercy. They are the mercy of kind people, you know, well-meaning Nigerians, people who donate to them. So that's why this report, reporters, this is very essential because 
because it brings it to public notice and people realize, oh, this is what is still going on. It's not what has happened, still going on, even as of today. So feeding is still a huge problem. They can't, you know, it's just very little that they can do. At some point, they got help from Nigerian customs, you know, they rise that they, uh, to collect it at some point was given to them, but that's not enough. But if, if they don't get that on a consistent basis, it, it means that 5,000 and counting people in the camp may not even get as much as breakfast or lunch. Do you see hope, considering the fact that just earlier in the news, we talked about the issue with the service chiefs, the continued uh, killings in Bornu and other parts mm -hmm. of the Northeast. Um, do you expect to see a reduction? Is there light at the end of the tunnel? What are your thoughts? Well, uh, in terms of the fight against insurgency, I can only say we are trying, but we have not completely gotten to the point where we are rid of it. Uh, th there is little amount of hope, honestly speaking, because when you come to the reality, these guys, these people you see in the camp, they are more than 3,000 actually, and they are from Borno, they are from Adamawa, they are from Nasrawa State. So it means that indeed things are happening in Nigeria. This fight is still on, the war is still on. We still need to do a lot. You know, the government of the day really, really needs to find a way to tackle this in reality as opposed to what we hear in the news. You know, technically they've been defeated. We need to see that, you know, actually that defeated. action, yes, uh, carried out indeed. Good job, Amaka, and thank, thank you for you so talking much. to us about it. Thank you, Felicity, for having me. All right. right now we have on the telephone a pastor, Solomon Folorushan. Thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we're still trying to look at the IDP situation uh, in this country. Uh, my colleague was at the camp to see firsthand what is going on. It has become a part of the Nigerian story. Are we seeing any progress? Uh, well, I would say in some areas there is a progress. There's progress in some aspects, especially in our center here. Uh, the IDP started arriving here between 2012 and 2014. And most of them were children, orphans, and widows. And uh, when they came in here, we realized that they need education. So we decided to put them to school. So it was very difficult for them and because they couldn't speak English and uh, because of the educational level of the area they came from the Northeast. The progress we're making with them today is that many of them now are in the universities doing uh, different studies like medicine, like surgery, law, engineering, pharmacy, and different courses. So that's the progress we are making. But the IDP situation in Nigeria is not, uh, it's not really uh, something that is good, good to hear about because because of the escalation of crisis, we now have more IDP everywhere. That's a major problem and major challenge. What are the areas of demand in the IDP camp where you're at? Uh, the number one demand and need is food. And IDPs need food. That's the number one. And two, they need uh, funding for their education. Like those who are in the university, they need their fees to be paid, they need scholarship. Uh, the staff that are here, the teachers, the head workers, they need uh, you know, to, uh, money for the staff salary. And many other things like the daily needs for the guests, sanitary pads, and other means that the normal human, I mean, the human beings use it. So those are the major needs. Are you getting support from Nigerians and the government? Sorry? Are you getting a support from Nigerians and the government? How are you managing to okay, fund? Okay, 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 okay. Well, we, we are living by the grace of God through Nigerians who are who comes occasionally to give support. And government is also doing their best. Uh, we, we can only appeal to them to do more. Like here, 
the government provides security. And yes, yeah, so we, we need the government to do more here. And sometimes because of the much work everywhere, we feel maybe the government is a bit forgetting that they have IDP in the news. But we want to appeal to them to remember that they are IDP. But so far, so we thank them for all they have done. Considering all the constraints and the stress you go through, why do you continue to do what you do? We cannot fold our hands and watch our neighbor suffering. You see, that is the problem that we have in this country. But thank God for those who are stretching their hands and hands of love to help the needy. You cannot have peace when your neighbor don't have peace. You cannot be eating when your neighbor has no food to eat. The love of God is what moves us to do what we are doing. Love your neighbor as you said. So, so we, we, we need to do what we are doing because they are our neighbors, they are our brothers, they are our sisters. And we just have to, to help them. Uh, and helping them make us happy, helping them make us satisfied. Because if you say these people well, because it's not happening to you, you are not going to do something for them. And the whole thing, it may be your turn tomorrow. So we derive satisfaction from helping others that are in need. Thank you very much, Pastor, for the work you do and for joining us. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome.